Well, praise the Lord. It's good to be here. Uh, we don't have a, a, a large group, so it'd probably be better for us to find unity in a smaller group. <laughs> but uh, praise God. Today, just from our reading there, I want to talk about something that is very foreign, very foreign in the world, and that is unity. Um, is this coming through fine? Yeah. Okay, good. Is unity. Uh, you know, I think about the United Nations, and it, it brings nothing but diversity, nothing but division, not unity to my mind. Uh, I think about our country these days. We look in, in, in our, our political system, and what do we find? Just complete and utter division. There, there's no unity. There's no, there's no singleness of heart or mind. Um, I look at the church today. And in the church, we don't see unity. We see so much division, so much struggle um, for true unity. You know, I, I think in my mind about what some, something that should represent unity is, is marriage. We know that in the scriptures that, that a man should leave his mother and father and cleave to his wife. They too shall be one flesh. Even the marriage is supposed to reflect uh, the love of Christ for the church and, and that sort of unity and that sort of love and compassion. You, know, you think about those beautiful weddings that you'll go to. It always brings a tear to my eye just to see uh, a gal and a guy. And uh, It's a beautiful day. It's, it's a day about tuxedos and, and wedding gowns and, and vows of commitment that are meant to bring two together for life. And what God has put us put together, let no man cast asunder. But we live in a culture that I think minimum 50% marriages end in divorce and division. And what's wonderful though, and I just want to think a little bit more about unity. I got this out of uh, one of my cross references, unity, oneness, harmony, agreement. Unity with a, uh, was apparent, and it's so interesting, unity was apparent on the day of Pentecost when the believers were with one accord in one place. The church is a unity in diversity, a fellowship of faith, hope, and love that binds believers together. And right here in this portion of scripture, we're gonna see what the gospel has created. Paul has desired to get to Jerusalem by Pentecost so that he could celebrate Pentecost. And, and, and looking back at that first day of Pentecost, and you think about the gathering of just 120 souls in an upper room, and there came a mighty rushing wind, and tongues of fire lighting over their heads as they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, that that poured out into the streets, and that they began to speak the wondrous works of God so that they could be heard among all these nations that had gathered to celebrate Pentecost from all over the Roman Empire. It was kind of like uh, the Tower of Babel in reverse. God had confused their language and divided man and sent them to the four corners of the earth, there to be, until the gospel, until God sent his own dear son to live that life and to, to be sinless and to be dead and buried and then again to rise again from the dead so that we don't have to live separate so that we no longer have to be separated from God but we can be unified with God so not only that we can't be unified and restored to a relationship with God but then restored to one another it's the very commission that Jesus sent forth go therefore and make disciples what of all nations. This bringing us together. Luke records, Behold, I send the promise of the Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endure, endued with power from on high, that then you might go. Tarry in the city of Jerusalem, that then you might go. And we know the beginning of the Acts of the Apostles. They're empowered by that Holy Spirit that would come to be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. What are they being witnesses to? 
to this mighty work of God in the Lord Jesus Christ through the power of the gospel to bring people together. I think back to that first day of Pentecost when Peter would preach the power, the power of what Christ had, had brought about, calling all men everywhere to repent. Let every one of you be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises to you and to your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God shall call. That was the first day that the church was gathered. That was the first day that there was again fellowship between God the Father and his people through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, reconciled to God. And what happened after that? The church then was born itself, and there was fellowship among the church. Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day, what? 3,000 souls were added to the church. There was forgiveness. There was unity. Where once there was complete division and a disparity that no one could ever thought could be gapped, that could be bridged in the gospel of Jesus, man and God are brought back together. Infinitely, holy God, holy, 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 sinful men and women and children, forgiven and restored. That's the story of the Acts of the Apostles. That's the power of the risen Lord Jesus. So the church was born, reconciliation with God and reconciliation with one another. And then we know the story of persecution came and, and we know that we have Peter's ministry and, and, and Saul, that great persecutor of the church, who then was turned around. And even through his persecution, the gospel went forth. The gospel then was spread out of Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria and then to the uttermost parts of the earth. Persecution continued to bring unity and forgiveness and restoration and reconciliation. Out of the most, the, the strangest apostle, the apostle to the Jews, he brought the gospel, Peter, to the Gentiles. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. The story is a story about unity. The story is a story about reconciliation, bringing together what a marriage is supposed to represent. One flesh committed to each other, in thick and thin, in life and in death, until death parts us. This is the unity we have through the power of the gospel. Today in this portion of scripture, we have worked our way through the beginning of the Acts of the Apostles. We've seen Pentecost. We've seen the ministry of Peter. We've seen the ministry of, of Paul. We've been spending the last good while in his three missionary journeys. Paul carrying the gospel all over the earth. And now he's returning to Jerusalem. And what we're going to see here is this is the last story. And this last story of Paul coming with his companions that are all from these different Gentile nations. They're actually bringing a gift from these different churches in this diverse uh, uh, nations where the, Paul is preaching to, to the Jews, bringing a gift to Jerusalem. It's an incredible picture as Paul gathers of what the gospel has produced. It's produced a people that are one in Christ. It's produced Jew and Gentile, the new Israel. And we continue to see this throughout time as the gospel goes forth, calling a people out of darkness into great light and then joining us together. The unifying power of the gospel is the message of the Acts of the Apostles. And right here, this is going to be our last, uh, 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 we're heading now to the final portions of the Acts of the Apostles. 
This is going to be a reunion. We're going to see unity. We're going to see the idea of being compromising in such a way that you can keep unity. And then we're going to see the idea of uncompromising to keep unity. And then after this, we're going to see Paul on the run in prison, speaking up for his faith. We're going to see, listen, here's the deal. In the, in the world, we have the brawl and the fight, as it were, as we stand for the truth. The world against the gospel. The very thing that was in the garden, that the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent, always at battle, always at war. But this is not the way it's supposed to be in the church. You see, we're called together to stand for truth and to stand together against the kingdom of darkness and see the kingdom of light extended. So in this portion, I really want to see how incredible that this today is the fruit of all of the Acts of the Apostles creating this church. Open with me, if you would, to, to Acts chapter 21, 15 to 26. Acts chapter 21, verses 15 through 26. The power of the gospel that brings unity. And after those days, we packed and went up to Jerusalem. Also, some of the disciples from Caesarea went with us and brought with them a certain Nason of Cyprus, an early disciple with whom we were to lodge. And when we had come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. On the following day, Paul went in with us to James, and all the elders were present. When he had greeted them, he told in detail those things which God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified God. And they said to him, You see, brother, how many myriads of Jews there are who have believed, and they are all zealous for the law. But they have been informed about you, that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, nor to walk according to the customs. What then? The assembly must certainly meet, and they will hear that you have come. Therefore, do what we tell you. We have four men who have taken a vow. Take them and be purified with them, and pay their expenses." so that they may shave their heads, and that all may know that those things of which they were informed concerning you are nothing, but that you yourself also walk orderly and keep the law. But concerning the Gentiles who believe, we have written and decided that they should observe no such thing, except that they should keep themselves from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. This is the word, well, 26 to, I'm sorry. Then Paul took the men the next day, having been purified with them, entered the temple to announce the expiration of the days of purification, at which time an offering should be made for each of them. Now this is the word of God. It is sufficient, it is inspired, and may it be instructive for us this morning. And, and just in this portion of scripture, it's, you know, you don't always get to pick your portion of scripture when you preach expositionally. You get what comes up. Uh, but the more I looked into this, I really think there's something profound in this little portion of scripture. This idea of the unity of those Gentiles, those believers from the ministry of Paul, uh, and those that now are myriads we're going to find out in Jerusalem. That 3,000 has grown to myriads of believers. <laughs> When they had come to Jerusalem, and you see there, the brethren received us gladly. There would never have been a time in Jerusalem when Gentiles would be received gladly. They would be uh, despised. They would be uh, questioned completely. They had to become Jews, as we found out, to be part of the elect. Well, that's no longer the case. The gospel now brings Jew and Gentile together in this one people of God. The power of the gospel reconciles wicked, rebellious, sinful man with this perfectly holy God, Jew and Gentile alike. They're now together. Look at verse 21 and 22. 
testifying. This is Paul now. Uh, excuse me. No, going back to what Paul testified to the Ephesian elders, this is the power of reconciliation that Paul has been preaching, that Peter preached, that, that brought this unified, this unity, testifying to Jews and also to Greeks, repentance towards God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. Now one again. Then down in 2028, 20, he would tell them, shepherd the church of God, which was purchased with his own blood. This is the powerful miracle of the gospel that God has purchased a people for himself, not just Gentile, not just Jew, but both together, reconciled in unity. True, lasting unity is impossible in this world. But in the world of the gospel of the kingdom, there is a togetherness that cannot be found in the world. And here's Paul in verse 19 and 20, just going on and on about his exploits in the Gentile nations that he preached the gospel, but really boasting on God and his work. When he had greeted them, he told them in detail those things which God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And here we are, Jew and Gentile alike, they glorified God together. The power and the authority of the Holy Spirit that was given to those disciples to preach the gospel is doing the very work that Jesus intended it to, bringing them together. Ephesians 2, 11, 13 says this, Therefore remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off were made nigh, Gentiles brought into the family of God. Here in verse 21, we see that James will do the very same thing, boasting about what God's doing, that now there are myriads of Jews that have come to faith, boasting at the power of the gospel. The power of the gospel is that where there's two people groups that were once at odds with each other, now they're made one in Christ. Where they were once at odds with God, they're made one with God. This is the power of the reconciliation and the power of the gospel. And we said there this morning, and just kind of, kind of rehearsing what is in Ephesians, that we're now called to endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. What's wonderful is the unity of the Spirit is something that is by the power of God. It's a people that he has called into unity with himself and called into unity with one another. And we see this gospel going forth and doing amazingly. So I don't think it's hard to say that, you know what, there may be no unity in the world. We may only see division and hatred and variance, but in the church, we don't have to see that. The power of the gospel is such to bring a real unity. But now what's interesting here is we see Paul uh, doing this, uh, taking this, this Nazarite vow. There were, there were men there, there was a concern in the Jewish believers that Paul was telling people, throw your Old Testaments away. You don't need those anymore. Throw the law of Moses away. Not just that, but don't even have your sons circumcised because you don't need to do that anymore. See, there's things that you cannot not do that the Old Testament requires us to do that they were accusing Paul of. But then there were customs, certain things in the Jewish faith where they could continue to do those things and still have it be part of their walk with the Lord. We know that Paul had Timothy circumcised. We know that Paul himself had taken a Nazarite vow earlier in the Acts of the Apostles. And James has a great idea. This is what we need you to do, Paul. We need you to also take this vow and pay for, their, for, for them. And, and, and just, there's a lot of minutia there about the Nazarite vow. But what we see here is Paul compromising, as it were, or doing something to keep unity among the body of believers. There is, there, there is, there is always a, a temptation in the church, as much as we're unified with God and unified with one another, but for some reason we don't see that type of unity. 
We normally see the same thing we see in the world. So here Paul is going outside of himself to try to bring some unity. Eckhard Schnabel says it this way. He explains what's going on here. Luke's report of Paul's meeting with James and the elders of Jerusalem's church highlights the significance of missionary work as God's mission. It demonstrates the importance of efforts to maintain the unity of the church by addressing tensions that exist. So what Paul is demonstrating here is his uh, desire and ability to go outside himself to promote unity, to promote a, a relationship where instead of them being at odds over these little things, they might be united and be able to walk. And it's so indicative of us as people, you know, it's that whole idea of, of judging. You know, take the log that's out of your own eye so you can see clearly to take the splinter out of your brother's eye. We seem to always be able to find little gray areas to pick at each other, to struggle about. You think about a, a, that couple on that beautiful day that they get married. I think about my white tuxedo with those white tails, sharing the gospel, waiting at the end of the aisle. As Michelle came down, she had this beautiful hat, and it was incredible. We made vows. We talked about how we would never break up, how we would just be committed to each other forever. The vows were wonderful. The love was intimate, and we were joined together. And then that first week happened, you know? Her hair is disheveled. I go for the toothpaste. The cap is off of it, and it was on. <laughs> At some point in that first year, I found myself laying in front of the front door as she wanted to go home to her mother and, and struggling to keep unity. But don't you see, that's the same way it is in the church. It's the same way it was in the church then, and it's the same way it is in the church now. Even that whole thing that they went through uh, in, the, in, in that Jerusalem council to determine what the, the Gentiles needed to do there was a portion in that that they recognized we've got now Jewish believers and Gentile believers coming together. And you know what? The Jews would not eat food that had blood in it. And the Gentiles, they would eat just about anything, right? And, I, and, and so here they were. The, the message explains back what actually is being said there. Uh, the last little part says, we continue to hold fast to what we wrote in that letter, namely, to be careful not, this is verse 25 out of the message, namely, uh, <clears throat> to be careful not to get involved in activities connected with idols, to avoid serving food offensive to Jewish Christians to guard the morality of the sex of marriage. So right involved in that portion, I don't know if we talked about it in verse 15, but the idea is that they, they thought about how can we bring these two groups of people together and have them actually get along. And, and you know what, if you've lived in a church and if you've been a, a member of a church for any number of years, you find out that it's just like marriage at times. We're at each other's throats over the littlest minutia. And it ought not to be so because there are so many wonderful things that join us together. We're called to unity. What God has put together, not man, cast asunder. That Michelle had to put up with the fact that my socks never end up in the basket. And this is how it needs to be in the church. There needs to be, in, in, at times, a compromise for the purposes of unity. There are many things that, that, that divide us, but they should not be those little things. 1 Corinthians, Paul puts it this way. This is the type of heart we need to have towards one another. This, this being able to put up with each other in such a way that we don't put each other under a microscope and divide over little silly things. For I know, Paul, uh, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, 19-23, For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win the more. And to the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law, is under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law, is without law, not being without law toward God, but under law toward Christ, that I might win those who are without law. To the weak I became as weak, 
that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Now this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker of it with you. Don't you know that's our challenge as Christians? But it's so much easier to, to argue over, over the, finer, the finer things of, 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 of the scriptures. Fight over things. We divide over the most ridiculous things. Look, look, look at the denominations. Now listen, we're going to see in part three there's things that we should be uncompromising about. But there's things that we need to be forgiving and giving about. We just went through the whole acts of the apostles there in, in chapter 20 where Paul's demonstrating the type of love and concern and, 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 and familiarity that needs to go on within the church. So here Paul is making a living example to, to go out of his way to compromise in such a way that he might strive for unity with, among the believers, that they might not be divisive and divided. You know, the Corinthians, if you read the letter to the Corinthians, this was a divisive group of folks. And they were apt to, to follow this one and to that one and, and to struggle. It says in, in 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 3, And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed, with you, I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it. Even now, you are still not able. So much of the church are a big bunch of babies going around with, they need the bottle again. They don't move on to the more important things. For you are still carnal, and that's the problem. There's so many carnal Christians, may we not be them. For where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? The gospel calls us not to be mere men and women but to be supernatural men and women now that are given to unity and congeniality. Some say, I am Paul. Other, I am Apollos. Are you not carnal? Within the body of Christ, this goes on. May it not be so within our body, but I'm afraid it is. I'm afraid it happens regularly. What do you say? I don't know if I quite agree with him there. Wait, no, no, no. They, they really don't know what they're talking about there. Instead of giving ourselves so much in the church, you know, especially in the Reformed church, and we're so hidey tidy with our theology, you know, we're, we're, we're doctrines of grace, we are Reformed, we got providence and sovereignty down great, but we don't know how to love our brother and sister in the church. And this is an example that we not ought not to be that way. We ought to be those that are striving for unity, that are looking that, you know, that there's sometimes where someone, maybe they just didn't quite say it right, or, or, or you've got to do something to watch out for each other. You know, in the, in the family, it's supposed to be husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. Christ gave himself for the church. Don't you know that's the same way the church should act with each other? that we should be looking to love each other, to look to build camaraderie and unity with each other, going out of our way, whatever it is. My favorite portion that Paul preaches, and the New King James gets it right, it says, behave like a Christian. <laughs> and then Paul writes this, let love be without hypocrisy, abhor what is evil, cling to what is good, be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love, in honor giving preference to one another, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given the hospitality. In this little section here, we see a picture of unity. Paul would finally say, if, for if it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. As much as depends on you, as much as depends on me, I want to sort them out. There's a problem with those guys. There's a problem with that gal, that girl. And something just doesn't sit right with me. Listen, you don't have to sort it like that. You'll know if something's really bad. It'll be glaring, right? But as much as we can to live at peace, 
peace with each other. Some of the scriptures that encourage us, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. We're called to be peacemakers. We're called to be those that, that foster unity and, and relationship. Hey, listen, in this world that is more and more set against us, we need to have each other's backs. That's right. Amen. We're in this together. If the enemy can divide us, he can trample us over. That one sheep off on their own, doing their own thing, is just meat for the wolves. But if we come together and pray for each other, care for each other, try to endeavor to keep unity of the spirit and the bond of peace, we've got a shot. Paul would say this, now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Do we endeavor for that? I've got the gift of division. I've got the gift of, of being critical, of backbiting, of talking about them behind their back, of gossip. That's not what mature Christians look like. They look like those that, 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 that strive to keep unity and fight division at all costs. In Galatians, Paul would say this, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, there's neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. I don't know. I think that one's a son of the devil. I don't know if that one's quite right. But we could be caring for each other calling each other, praying for you. You know, I know what a good thing is when you've got problems with your brother or your sister, pray for them. It's hard to have hard feelings towards someone you're praying for. That's right. Philippians, therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, Having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or deceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only on his own interests, but also on the interests of others. The local church is called into community, community, that we might care and watch for each other. Behold how good it is, how pleasant for brethren to dwell together in unity. Oh my goodness, most of my experience of being with the brethren is fighting like cats and dogs. It's like my brother and I growing up. Knuckle sandwiches, wedgies, beating each other up. <laughs> it's the same thing in the church, but it ought not to be so. That's right. In the local church, when you're committed to each other, you care for each other, you pray for each other. Let brotherly love continue. And I strive with this as a pastor, and I look out at all of the division going on in the church, and I see this pastor and that pastor, and I hear what this guy writes and that guy writes. And, and we've got to be on top of our game, but, and we've got to be big, biblically connected, but we also have to endeavor to keep the unity of the faith. Even if that means Matthew 18, going to our brother, hashing this out. Instead of sorting someone behind their back, in our culture, man, you go on Twitter and just rake on someone, and they don't never know who you were. <laughs> uh, we ought not to be those type of people. We've got to be those that are endeavoring, what, as much as lies within us, to live peaceably with all men, to be able to compromise where we can to gain unity. Now listen, my final point, uncompromising to keep unity. Paul was not throwing the law of Moses away. Paul was not encouraging the, the Gentiles to sin and not to recognize that the Old Testament and Moses' law and, and, and doing right was, was not still there. Zealous for the law, but they have been informed about you 
that you teach all Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses. Absolutely false. Acts 21, 25. Keep themselves from things offered to idols. We went, we went over that. The Gentiles weren't encouraged to, 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 to have other gods before the one true God. They were commended to obey the commandments. They were told to stay away from sexual immorality. They shall not commit adultery. They shall not cover their neighbor's husband or wife. Listen, our, our marriages, we got to watch out for each other, right? About the whole toothpaste and squeezing from the middle and, and our, our, our clothes not getting in the hamper. But we don't put up with adultery. That's right. Right? That's right. But, but we don't put up with, with sin. We don't run around. We don't talk to girls and guys on the side. Our marriage has to be pure. So, so I'm not saying we need to compromise the scriptures to strive to keep unity. We need to keep the scriptures very uh, clearly and, and all that, that is there, endeavor to, to get a hold of it as much as we can so that we can defend the faith. So you know what? There's going to come times where we do divide over doctrine. But, but may we have completely gone through it rightly. May we handle it in such a way that we've confronted each other biblically and rightly. If there's something that we really got to go to the mat about, we better have a good handle on what it actually says. We got to know our scriptures. And, and, and as we deal with some of these things coming down the pike that is dividing the church, I'm convinced that, that God is purifying the church. And we need to be a pure example of Christianity here being completely biblically literate so we can properly defend the faith. But do you see the two differences? Unity where we can compromise and, and keep together, but then where things come to a level where you got to say, listen, that's not cutting it. But, but here in our church, if there's disagreement, we've got to bring the scriptures to bear with each other. And there's got to be a mentality of love between us that we keep unity. I'm not saying compromise the values of the scriptures. God has for sure unified us with himself through the gospel. God has unified us with one another, but we must also be uncompromising when it comes to the truth of the scriptures. Do you, do you get the balance there? Right? But Paul, whenever he could, he bent over backwards to maintain unity. You know, we need to, comp we need to cooperate for the purposes of the gospel. They were the church spread throughout first century Rome, and they were the church in Jerusalem, and they came together to be the church unified. But trust me, I'm not wishy-washy. There's things I'm not going to compromise on, and I suspect none of us should. But there has to be a difference the way we handle things. Jude would say this, Behold, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once delivered to all the saints. For certain men have crept in unnoticed, who, look, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turn the grace of God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God, and our Lord Jesus Christ. So, so there's a time to throw down. There's a time to divide over doctrine and, and be uncompromisingly committed to the truth of the scriptures. And that'll be for the sake of unity. But in this time of, of purifying in the church, may we draw together with those of like precious faith. May we not divide over minutiae but may we join together on the supreme and wonderful and important doctrines of the scripture. May we be Im immovable when it comes to the Bible. We need to contend for every point. So we need to know what we believe. 2 Timothy 3, 14 and 17, these scriptures, knowing the scriptures that were breathed out by God, that are profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, we need to know our scriptures. But I think God is calling for unity in the midst of this difficult time. We cannot adopt the ways of the world and just cast each other off in an easy fashion. As much as we can, we need to draw together. 
God desires that we might have unity in the church. And I believe some of this is causing people to really sort in their hearts what they believe and why they believe it. Because you know what? You're not going to die for something you're not convinced of. And we need to be ready to die for the truth of the gospel. We're going to see now in the rest of this, Paul is going to contend with the world. Paul is going to contend with unbelievers. Paul is going to contend with those who want to kill him. And I very much believe the time that we live in now is very similar to that first century uh, Roman Empire, where there's such polarity between those who believe and those in power. And so, so there's going to have to be a unity, I pray. Just in closing, let's open to John 17. We were reading that this morning. What I saw in this portion of scripture is that God calls us to great unity, but he also calls us to contend for the faith so that we don't compromise for unity. Look at verse 11. This is the high priestly prayer of our Lord Jesus. Uh, I, I commend it to you. It's just wonderful. But we see what unity there was in the Godhead. Unity from before the foundations of the earth. God the Father, God the Son, the Holy Spirit in perfect unity. And then God brings his, his believers that were his from the beginning, from before the time uh, of the, the foundations of the earth that are called into this unity. Look at verse 11. Now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to you, Jesus, praying for those disciples. Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. The type of unity we are called to is the same type of unity we see in the Godhead. If there's that type of unity in Christ, we're not going to be lopping each other's heads off. I find the longer that Michelle and I are married, we actually do love each other. <laughs> and I actually do sacrifice for her. And she actually does love me, despite who I am. But there's a oneness, there's a unity in the marriage that God intended that grows. And this is what we have here as the church. We should grow in it. And then down to Jesus praying for us today, uh, verse 20 through 23. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us. Why? That the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one. Why? That the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Amen. There's a way that a Christian is called to contend and live. There's a way that Christians are called to disagree that doesn't look like the way the world disagrees. Right? And, and, and I think it's demonstrated here by Paul. I think scripture is clear that we're called to unity uh, in, in Christ. And it's something that we can have. In a world that is dead set against each other, we can be one in Christ. So let's pray. Father, I just thank you for your word, God. We thank you for the power of the gospel that has joined us once again uh, with you. Where once we are, we're far off, we've now been made nigh by the blood of Christ. That now, God, we can have your Holy Spirit living within us. That we can be one with the Father and with the Son. That the Father and the Son are with us everywhere. And that, God, we can now be one as the church. That there can be true unity so that we can stand against the wiles of the devil so that we might as one contend for the faith and live for your glory. But help us, Father. Help us to know where there's just gray areas that we should overlook. Help us know where we should be extending grace to one another. Help us to, to think the best of each other whenever we possibly can. But Lord God, give us discernment when we must stand with you and your word against 
So, Father, we thank you for this time together. Pray, God, that you would keep us. Pray, Lord God, that you might watch over those that are away from us today, Father, and bring us all back together, if it be your will, uh, this coming Tuesday, Father, we pray. In Jesus' precious name, amen.